and I'm interested in how people learn to use the angle exoskeletons. We previously found a solution for a slightly different question. How do we teach the exoskeletons how to work with people? And the answer to that, unsurprisingly, is human in the loop optimization. So Sasha explained this very nicely yesterday, um, but just a brief summary. We optimize assistance parameters to maximize human performance all while the person is using the device. And we saw big results, cool. But why does it work? Maybe we found a generically good pattern that will just work for anyone. Maybe there's some additional benefit to customization. But maybe it has nothing to do with the device and is really just about how the person adapts with the exoskeleton. So let's dig a little deeper into that. First of all, human in the loop optimization gives the participant a lot of exposure to the device. Each loop or a generation of the optimization takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And as Natalia said yesterday, adaptation may take a very long time. With this optimization, we also see a wide variety of initial torque patterns, forcing the participants to explore a variety of coordination patterns. And finally, as the optimizer converges, the sample torque patterns become more similar to the optimal trajectory, so the participant spends more time in their customized profile. So we designed an experiment to tease out the different contributions of that generically good assistance profile, customization, and training. Using our bilateral exoskeletons and an expanded protocol from our previous study. In addition to baseline trials on each day, we included a test of the generic profile before any adaptation to see how people do without any training. That same profile was then tested on each subsequent day after a 72 minute adaptation block to see improvements with training and was compared to the customized profile where appropriate. To separate potential training effects, we tested three groups. The first is the static group, which experienced the same generic torque for the entire adaptation block. The continued optimization group was the most similar to our previous study. They experienced human in the loop optimization, where each day started from the end of the previous day. And then we had a re-optimization group, which also experienced human in the loop optimization, but with the same seed for every day, as if restarting the optimization. So some initial results. Um, just looking at the group most similar to our initial study, we see that the generic profile is pretty good with a 30.8% reduction in metabolic cost compared to zero torque. But customization is better with a 38.4% reduction. Looking at the individual groups, um, participants who only experienced the generic profile were able to learn how to use the device as were participants who walked with the traditional human-in-the-loop optimization, although that training took several days, more on the order of five to six days. These participants, the continued optimization group, may perform better than the static group, but we need more data to confirm this. However, re-optimization seems to interfere with training, so it's clear that the type of training has a strong effect on the ability to use the device. This is also apparent when you look at the performance with the customized profiles, where the continued optimization, um, individually, each person does better with the customized profiles over time, but the re-optimization group does not, again, suggesting that optimization takes more than four generations to converge. So some final takeaways before we get into questions. Um, people can successfully use generic or the customized assistance, although customization can often provide greater benefits, and the length and type of training matters. Failures of previous exoskeletons to deliver benefits may have actually been failures of training. Thanks. Yes, it's John. Yeah, a couple of years ago at the Finland meeting, the MIT group did the same sort of thing with actuated ankles, and the, the subjects adapted really well until they were told what was happening, and then nobody adapted. So that's sort of like upper brain center versus lower brain center interference. Have you thought about that at all, and what kind of instructions were given to these people? So these were all naive participants, and the instructions were relax, walk comfortably, just let the device do the work for you. How about for the re-optimization? Same for every participant. Every participant, every day, same instructions. Oh, uh, that's... <laughs> So, do you have an, uh, so if I look at the continued optimization group there, do you have an idea about the difference in the control?
control that the person is bringing to the different um, types of torque profiles. And so my question is, is like, it seems like they're able to context switch. Is that if I think of these like prism glasses, right, of, of different of different diopters, that they're able to realize they have these different prism glasses on in these different situations relative to equipping, so they can switch from one control strategy to another really quickly. Is that is that the case? Like, do they bring to the table? Different control strategies after learning this, so that it's different things with their muscles. Potentially, um, right now, so we're collecting a full biomechanics data set, 100 gigs per participant. So I need to do a little bit of data analysis, um, but just visually, some people really change their coordination strategies. So, um, so if you look at the different participants, so the participant in yellow who did really well. Um, this participant actually um, said that they let the device place their foot for them, depending on the type of assistance that they received. Whereas the participant in blue, who did even better, kinematically they looked exactly the same with every um, controller. And so it is, I don't see any obvious um, changes in control other than what I see in the kinematics. The muscle activity, nothing popped out at me yet, but we'll be running statistical analyses to see that. So what, what the um, pr prism glass world, people who do this sort of things would do, wouldn't necessarily be to collect, would you say, 100 gigs of data or something? They, but instead, what you do is you probe with the other, with the other like static or the or the optimized one. So you give that. Um, so after they're like, the, after they've learned in the static situation, is that you so you you then apply the exoskeleton controller that you're optimized one, and you would see how long, whether or not they're, they immediately get it, or whether or not they take some time to adapt to it, and you can probe in both, both directions. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that might be difficult with our current paradigm, though, um, because it, um, so the, the customized profiles that you give people are um, technically new, they have not experienced this before. Um, but the generic profile is something that they both train on every single day, um, but all, every single day at the end of the trial, but also at least um, for eight minutes during the adaptation block. Um, I, I think we may be able to do something like that if we bring people back in and give them a different <coughs> controller. Uh, James, and then Sean, and then you. I just had a question about the generic static controller. So I, I think you said that that controller was sort of generally optimized for a previous study, maybe now transitioning that to this study. Um, and my question is, how much do you think that pre-optimization matters? So if you just gave someone a completely generic assistive torque that you think might work, and you give them six days, right? Are people just really good at eventually learning to take advantage of something? Or do you think that pre-optimization so the pre-optimization gives us kind of the baseline for where they started and where they've improved. Some people just naturally do really well with the device on the first day. So that first participant got a 28% reduction on the first day and just maintained that for all subsequent days. Um, but other participants, often I'll see that they do not learn how to use the device the first time we turn it on. So we do a, a double reversal validation uh, randomization. So participants experience the generic profile twice on the first day. Um, the first time they tend to do really, really badly, and the second time will do a little bit better and it averages to no benefit. So you know, presumably the, that controller is suboptimal for one yes. of all of those people, and yet they all get to about the same level of 20% reduction, right? So, to understand, better understand the role of the uh, subject-specific optimization, how much, how much does it matter? Yeah, so with the continued optimization group, it does matter. Yeah, and you can see that in the metabolics, but I also, if you look at the specific controllers for each participant, um, the black line here is a peak torque of about 55% of the maximum torque that we allow. But the participants that did really well on the right tend to optimize more towards like 75% of the maximum report. Uh, the next person should come in and set up. Uh, oh, Benjamin? Yes. Oh, here. Okay, go for it. Um, Sean, good question, and then. Hi, yeah, Sean O'Connor, Planning State. Uh, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about that initial seed and 
how far it was from maybe an optimized solution. It seems like me like the results on the reoptimization group could depend a lot on what that initial seed is and how good or bad it is initially. Yeah, the initial seed is not great. But um, the reason that we wanted to test that reoptimization group, um, so there, there were kind of two reasons for testing it. One was that you had to see the wide variety of initial torques, so that showed some sort of um, randomness. But then um, we also did four generations because that's what we did in our initial study where we saw the 24% reduction. And it worked really well for the unilateral case, but with bilateral exoskeletons, because it's a more complex system, people needed more time to adapt and thus more time to optimize. Can you explain what not great means? Like, is it timing or amplitude? So the parameters briefly are um, a magnitude, the timing of that peak magnitude, and then both onset and fault and um, offset. The timing of that peak is the most important, and we tend to optimize that around close to 55% of stride, which is the- Probably stop that. Yes, sir. But, but I'm gonna let you give a five second question and a five second answer. Exactly five seconds. My name is Lauren from ETH Zurich. Um, where do you exactly consecutive testing days adjacent to each other? No. Yeah. Um, they were at least one day of rest in between. Some people had up to two weeks in between. Okay. Let's start it again.